Today we have three readings from Matthew. The first reading is Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The second reading is Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The final reading is Matthew 26, 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Hey everyone, we are in week two of our series, Jesus People. And in this series, we're taking a look at some of Jesus' key teachings and asking how we can live those teachings out. There's really nothing clever about this series. It's pretty straightforward. It's exactly what churches ought to do, right? Uh, investigating Jesus' teachings, asking how to embody them better. That's what we're doing in this series. Now, normally, we're just touching on one passage um, in the Gospels each week. But today we're looking at three different passages that all have something in common. Specifically, as you heard, each of these passages, uh, Jesus tells his followers to take something. Okay, first you heard Jesus to tell his followers to take his yoke upon them. And then you heard Jesus tell his followers to take up their cross. And then finally, you heard Jesus tell his followers to take the bread. The yoke, the cross, and the bread, the three things that Jesus tells us to take. Now, as I was investigating these passages and just thinking more about each of these things that Jesus tells us all to take, uh, it, it dawned on me that these aren't just random items that Jesus uh, has us take. Rather, each of these items uh, addresses a deep question that we all have. You see, the three items Jesus tells us to take also correspond to three of life's deepest questions. And I think it's really important for us to make this connection in order to understand what's going on in the Gospels. You see, part of what it means to be human is to ask questions. I'm not sure if you've noticed this, but um, humans ask a lot of questions, particularly children, okay? Particularly children. In fact, I read one study once that said that a, uh, one kid can ask over 288 questions in a single day. We ask a lot of questions. If you're a parent, uh, that shouldn't surprise you much because sometimes it can drive you almost nuts. Uh, but what would surprise you is if one day your dog asked you a question. That would surprise you, wouldn't it? See, animals, they don't ask questions. Humans, though, we ask a lot of questions because we humans have this unique ability called reflection. I don't mean like in a mirror. I mean the ability to... Uh, think deeply and carefully about things, to ponder, to wonder, to investigate, that sort of stuff. That's what humans do. Spiders and dogs and whales and chairs and rocks, they don't reflect on things, but humans do. We are reflective creatures. In fact, I'm going to push it a step further and say it's not only that we can ask questions, I'm going to say part of being human is, is that we must ask questions. I think there's something about us that compels us to ask questions. And there are certain questions that every person asks, whether they realize it or not. And so when Jesus told us to take up the yoke, the cross, and the bread, he was giving us the answer to three of these questions that everybody asks, whether we recognize it or not. Three of life's deepest questions. And, and some of us are intentional with answering these questions in life. Some of us uh, try to reflect more deeply than others. And so we, we identify these questions and we try to be purposeful about our answers. Others of us don't even know we're asking them, but we're still asking them. We're searching for the answers nonetheless. Each of the things Jesus tells us to take answers one of life's biggest questions. So here's the key. You must answer these questions. And, and, and when I say you must, I don't mean that you should. I mean that by virtue of being human, you will answer them or likely already have answered them. It's just part of being human. 
whether you realize it or not, whether you like it or not. The questions we will discuss are as inescapable as breathing. So let's dive in. The first thing Jesus tells us to take is the yoke. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. At first glance, it's hard to see how uh, Jesus can make a yoke sound easy because uh, the idea of a yoke is about as uncomfortable as it gets. There's a picture of a yoke that you can see here, um, and you'll notice the yoke is what binds oxen to one another and to the plow so that they can be controlled by the farmer. In Jesus' day, a yoke was like a metaphor for the teachings of a, of a teacher or of a rabbi in ancient Israel. And often these yokes, these teachings, were very strict. They were telling you how to best uh, obey the laws in the Old Testament. And so often a rabbi's yoke was a great burden. Uh, it was a teaching that had lots of things to know and to do. Now, when you look at that picture of a yoke, um, if you're anything like me, you know, you're thinking, okay, I don't care how light your yoke is, I just don't want no yoke. You know what I mean? Like, like to be a yoke, to, to wear a yoke is to be constrained. To be yoked to something is to give up control, it's to give up freedom. A yoke is oppressive. And so I wouldn't blame you if you're thinking, well, that looks uncomfortable, I'll just pass on the whole yoke thing entirely, how's that? However, that reaction, this idea that, well, I'm just not going to wear a yoke, that betrays our ignorance about ourselves. You see, we think uh, that we don't wear a yoke, but the fact is, everybody wears a yoke. Everybody wears a yoke. You can't not wear a yoke. It's just a matter of which one. Listen, your yoke tells you who or what you serve. That's what a yoke tells you. It is what tells you who your master is. And we all serve something or someone. Another way to say it is this. Uh, we all worship something. Humans are irreducibly religious creatures. We all look for something to worship, whether we're religious or not. Even when we have no religion, we're still religious. We will find something to worship, whether we realize we're doing it or not. I want to read once again a uh, David Foster Wallace quote that I've read before, but it's good enough that I'm not tired of it yet. Here's what it says. There is no such thing as not worshiping, he says. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body and beauty and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Everybody wears a yoke. You may think you don't have a yoke, but that just shows how unreflective you're being at the moment. Some people think that they call the shots for themselves, but like what David Foster Wallace pointed out, there's always some unfulfilled desire in us that is driving us. That's what becomes our master. We're all looking for something or for someone to worship. We're looking for transcendence. It's not a matter of if you're worshiping something or someone, it's a matter of what or who. The yoke answers this question. Who is my master? That's the deep question in life that the yoke answers. And it's one of those questions that's in the heart of every person, whether we acknowledge it or not. We're all looking for a master to follow. We're all looking for someone to worship. And if we don't answer it for ourselves, then, then Wall Street or some political party or the social media algorithms or the marketing department at Apple or Nike will be happy to answer the question for you. In other words, if you can't name who your master is, it might be one of those. Because we all worship something. The question we should ask is not, do I have a yoke, but rather, which yoke will I wear? So, you may wonder, what, what makes Jesus' yoke so much better? You're thinking, okay, so maybe if I grant you this point that we all wear a yoke, why should I wear Jesus' yoke? What makes that one so special? Why should I not simply decide to gratify my desires or give myself to this or that political cause or to find enlightenment through some other means? If we all wear a yoke, how do you know Jesus' yoke is best? What's so light about Jesus' yoke? Well, here's my answer to that. Every other yoke you'll find will eventually lead you to the place of having to do more and to be more. 
if your cause is to gratify your desires, then your body and your soul, your mind will adjust and eventually you're going to have to give more and more input in order to be satisfied. Your satisfaction will never last long. If your cause is a political or social one, which by the way, that can be wonderful, but if that's your yoke, you'll eventually discover that, that you're not enough for that either. In fact, sometimes the most vocal advocates for a cause get to the end of their career and find that the cause that perhaps they started has passed them by and now looks back on them as not having done enough. Cancel culture can turn on its own. You'll eventually realize that you can't do it all. Every other yoke you're going to find will exhaust you. But Jesus' yoke is different. Jesus' yoke is the only one that wants more for you than it wants from you. Jesus' yoke does not ask, what can you do, but says, it has been done. To take on Jesus' yoke is to follow the way of a king who's already won the battle. Other yokes look for value in what you can bring and what you can do. Jesus' yoke is the only one that sees you as intrinsically valuable already. To carry Jesus' yoke, to take on his teachings, to live your life in the way that Jesus tells you to live, that is simply to move with the grain of the universe. It is simply to live life as it's supposed to be lived. It is to simply get swept up in the current that's already moving to, towards God rather than fighting it like every other yoke does. That's why his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It's just to live life as it was meant to be lived, to acknowledge that we all have a master. So why not make your master the one who actually created life? That's why Jesus' yoke is better than any other. The second thing Jesus tells us to take is the cross. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Now, at first glance, the cross seems to contradict the yoke because there's nothing easy about a cross. The yoke is easy, the burden is light, but there's nothing easy and light about a cross, right? A cross is an ancient Roman instrument of torture and death. The yoke and the cross seem to be at odds with one another, don't they? But the yoke and the cross do not contradict, rather they're just answering different questions. See, the yoke answered the question, who is my master? But the cross answers this question, what purpose do I have? Just as your body needs oxygen, your soul needs purpose. And when I say that, I'm being literal. There's a suicide note that was discovered, and here's what it said. It said, imagine a happy group of morons who are engaged in work. They are carrying bricks in an open field. As soon as they have stacked all the bricks at one end of the field, they proceed to transport them to the opposite end. This continues without stop, and every day of every year, they are busy doing the same thing. One day, one of the morons stops long enough to ask himself what he is doing. He wonders what purpose there is in carrying the bricks. And from that instant on, he is not quite as content with his occupation as he had been before. I am the moron who wonders why he is carrying the bricks. You see, this man who wrote that note could no longer find meaning in his existence. Viktor Frankl, he's a great psychotherapist, he wrote about his experience in a Nazi concentration camp. Well, not any Nazi concentration camp, he was at Auschwitz. And in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he observes this. He says, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. In other words, prisoners who had a purpose to live, he said, even in the midst of the horrors of Auschwitz, they could find a way to survive. If they had a purpose, they could face almost anything, even the horrors of a Nazi concentration camp. The reason for this is that humans are meaning-making machines. We're meaning-making machines. In other words, we demand to make sense of things. So imagine you're watching this sermon right now, and a clown just sauntered behind me across the screen. Imagine that happened and I didn't even do anything. I just kept going as though nothing occurred. If that were to happen, uh, you would be like, wait a second, what is going on here? Uh, Phil, why was there a clown on your sermon video? This demands an explanation. And if I were to just ignore it and go on as though nothing happened, that would be unacceptable to you, right? You demand to make sense of that event. Now, if a cat saw it, it probably wouldn't care. They wouldn't wonder why that happened. They're not trying to make sense of it. It just happened, you know? 
But humans, we're meaning-making machines. We gotta connect things into a coherent narrative. We have to make sense of the things that we experience. We instinctively try to fit our experiences into a narrative that makes sense. And if that's true for something as small as a clown walking across the screen during a sermon, how much more is it true for your life as a whole? We need meaning and purpose in life. The great psychiatrist Irvin Yalone wrote that human, the human being seems to require meaning. To live without meaning, goals, values, or ideals seems to provoke, as we have seen, considerable distress. This is what is significant about the cross. When Jesus tells us to take up our cross, he's not simply just saying, hey, you need to suffer. Live a life of suffering. That's, that's just what I want you to do. That's not what Jesus is saying. Rather, when Jesus tells us to take up our, tells us to take up our cross, he's telling us to join his mission. He's giving us an answer to the question, what is my purpose? See, taking up a cross is to step into God's mission of redeeming a broken world. It's to, it's to take upon ourselves the means by which Jesus redeemed this world so that we can extend it and continue it farther. And yes, that means that we must suffer. But that's just it. Listen, meaning requires suffering. It's just the reality of life. Once more, hear the words of Viktor Frankl. He says, The way in which a man accepts his fate and all the suffering it entails, the way in which he takes up his cross, gives him ample opportunity, even under the most difficult circumstances, to add a deeper meaning to his life. Meaning requires suffering. There's no way around it. And your soul needs meaning. Which means you're going to have to suffer for something in life. Anything that's meaningful will be hard to do. But that doesn't mean that we should avoid it. Because see, here's one of the great, another great paradox in life. The more you aim at happiness, the less you'll find it. But the more you aim at purpose, you'll get happiness as a consequence. So why not take up the greatest purpose of all? To take up your cross is to join God's cosmic mission to renew all of creation. It's, harder to, it's hard to think of a grander purpose than that, isn't it? But that is exactly what a disciple of Jesus signs up for. When they obey the command to take up their cross, it is a calling to put, it is a call to put calling over comfort, to put purpose over pleasure, and to find that in the end, they didn't gain the whole world but lose their soul. Rather, they forfeited their selfishness, we forfeited our selfishness, and we gained purpose in life. So that's what the cross does. The cross, when we take that up, we gain an answer to the question of what is my purpose? And finally, we have the bread. This is the third thing Jesus tells his followers to take. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. Now, in the book of Acts, chapter 10, the apostle Peter described himself and the other, the other apostles as this. He says, there are those who ate and drank with Jesus. Now, Peter is not referring to the Last Supper in this particular instance. When he says that they ate and drank with Jesus, he's not talking about the, the famous Last Supper where we draw communion from. He's talking about a different meal with Jesus. This one happened on a beach after Jesus rose from the dead. Um, but I think it's important to notice that, nonetheless, this is how they identify themselves. We are the ones who ate and drank with Jesus, they say. What's so special about eating and drinking with Jesus exactly? Well, theologian Rowan Williams writes that if we were to walk around ancient Galilee um, in the first century and, and we heard a lot of noise and laughter and talking and singing, he says we could be reasonably confident that Jesus of Nazareth must be close by. Because Jesus created fellowship everywhere that he went. In fact, uh, sometimes it got him into trouble because he was associating with people he shouldn't associate with. Sometimes it embarrassed his friends, but they couldn't stop him from doing it. Jesus' favorite thing to do was to hang out with people who no one else saved a seat for. You know, the typical cafeteria scene in middle school, right? The nerd walks into the cafeteria, everybody in the room like picks up their backpack, backpack and puts it on the seat next to them so that he won't sit with them. Not Jesus, though. Jesus waves him over to his table, and pretty soon, uh, that's the table. Jesus' table is the one that everyone's looking at because it's so loud and full of laughter that it's like disturbing the rest of the cafeteria. That's the way Jesus worked. He created belonging everywhere he went. 
To the night Jesus told his followers to take the bread, something similar was happening. He was telling his disciples, hey, you're with me. In the ancient world, table fellowship was a clear sign of acceptance. When Jesus serves the bread to his disciples, he's communicating to them that they matter. That makes it significant to realize that one of, one of the people that Jesus serves that night was Judas. Jesus serves his betrayer. He has a meal with the person who is going to betray him. He even makes room for Judas at his table. It's because the Bible makes clear that this, an, an invitation to Jesus' table is never based on what you can bring. Unlike the systems of the world that, that turn on what you can produce or what you can do, Jesus' table uh, does not require your resume. Even Jesus' betrayer is served at Jesus' table. Rather, Jesus' table, we are forced to sit in that vulnerable and awkward position uh, where we have nothing to give and simply have to accept the fact that Jesus simply wants us there because he likes us. And there's nothing else we can do about it. That's hard for us to accept, believe it or not. See, in our culture, if somebody invites you over for a meal, the first thing we ask is, okay, sure, what can I bring? What can I do to kind of, you know, even the ledger a little bit? You're doing this kind of thing for me. How can I return the favor in some small way? But there's nothing you can bring to Jesus' table except for yourself. And that's all that Jesus wants. This is one of the things that communion teaches us. Jesus simply wants to be with us. Rowan Williams says in Holy Communion, Jesus Christ tells us that he wants our company. This brings us to the heart of the question that the bread answers for us. The bread answers the question, does anybody love me? This may be the most important question of all. It's the question we ask before we're even aware of ourselves, before we can even speak. The need to be loved is with us, even in our mother's wombs. When a baby is not given the love they need even before they're born, it can have effects that last a lifetime. You see, we are relational creatures, but we don't simply need a lot of relationships. We need at least one relationship that is unconditional. We need at least one relationship, somebody, we need to know that there's someone that takes us for who we are, who loves us not based on what we can provide for them, but simply for who we are. Somebody that we don't have to perform for, who, who gave us their love before we ever even knew we needed it. Listen, at the table of Jesus, even Judas is handed some bread. And it's because Jesus' love for Judas existed prior to anything Judas did or did not do. There was nothing Judas could do to make Jesus love him less. And so I hope you can see now that the three things that Jesus tells us to take answer three questions in life. The yoke tells us who our master is. The cross tells us what our purpose is. The bread tells us that we are loved. Christians are the ones who eat and drink with Jesus. That's a big deal. We therefore know the unconditional love that God has for us. See, we all need a table to sit at in life. And Jesus has saved us a spot at his. So let's eat and drink with him now. So as we've learned, when Jesus tells us to take the bread, he's answering this deep question we all have. Does anybody love me? And the answer is yes. God loves you. God has loved you from before you ever, you ever even knew that you needed love. From before you ever even existed, God has loved you unconditionally, eternally. Not based on what you can do, but simply based on who you are. That's what the table of Jesus tells us. And that's what we get to sit at right now. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let me take the bread and dip it in the cup, and enjoy the presence of the Lord with you at communion.
Would you pray with me? Oh God, as Table Church, as we aim to go back inside the playhouse after this long season of wandering in the desert, would you go before us? Lord, would you go before us and prepare a place for us? <laughs> would you part the sea? Would you, Lord, would you prepare the land? What, whatever metaphor we want to use from the Bible, God, I ask that you would do it. I'll be honest, I'm a little nervous. Um, it's tough. It's tough to lead a church and plant a church in these times. Uh, but God, in times like this, I have to remember the things that we just heard from your word that um, that you've given us a purpose, that you've given us your word, that, that we are loved. And in the end, that's all we really need. And so I can't wait to worship you with the body again. I can't wait to uh, to proclaim your goodness, God, as a, as a body. And, and I, Lord, ask that that would be true whether we're on site or online, but God, wherever we are, that we would feel this supernatural sense of togetherness and of community. Lord, form Table Church into a better church than it's ever been before. That when this is all over, God, when we someday look back on 2020 as a memory, we would be able to say, we came back stronger from that. We came back better disciples from that. And that we'd be able to give you all the glory and praise. And so, Lord, I pray that you would have your hand upon each home, each individual listening or watching this. Um, and, God, that they would sense your presence richly dwell in them now. That you would encourage the hearts of those who are sad. God, that you would strengthen those who are feeling fearful. God, that you would quicken those who are feeling tired. Lord, may we be your people ready for mission and at your service. We love you in your name. Amen.